so we were discussing the code based seismic analysis and design procedures and in that uh, let's quickly discuss now the linear time history analysis obviously it is a very detailed procedure itself and uh, it cannot be covered in just one quick session but uh, let's quickly sweep through some of its basic steps and then let's see what ibc 2021 or asc 7-16 uh, provide some provisions about the linear time history analysis when used for the design of new buildings or the evaluation of existing buildings so we already have a quick introduction of this method it is the rigorous dynamic analysis uh, although it uses a linear elastic computer model but it uh, actually uses the the acceleration time history of ground as an input or as a representative of the seismic shaking so we apply uh, the acceleration time history ground time history as an input to our linear model and let it shake or develop the inertial forces damping forces and elastic restoring forces and then we compute the maximum demands or time history demands as an output from our computer model so let's uh, quickly go through step by step procedure so although each of these steps which i am discussing now requires a, a detailed discussion and uh, a lot of explanation but i'll just mention some important or basic things so step 1 is the development of a consistent criteria for ground motion selection obviously in this method we apply the ground acceleration history to our computer model so we must first select few ground motions uh, from the past recorded data and then that selection uh, should be based on a consistent criteria a realistic criteria which should match with the seismicity level or faulting mechanism which is expected at our own site site class and source to site distance so i just mentioned three four important parameters which you should consider while selecting past ground motions uh, for the purpose of dynamic analysis of your building so uh, if the seismicity level of your site is quite high uh, you should consider the earthquakes which are already recorded at locations which have a high seismic hazard level similarly if the seismic hazard at your site is controlled or mainly governed by a particular fault having a particular faulting mechanism like normal fault or strike slip fault for example then you should select past ground motions which are produced which were produced actually by a fault having the same faulting mechanism similarly site class if your site class is a particular let's say site class d then you should focus on those past ground motions which were recorded at site class d where the recording station was situated on a site which is designated as, as site class d and one of the most important parameter is source to site distance that if the governing fault which can contribute significantly to the hazard level of your site uh, is located at a particular distance let's say 100 km from your site you should focus on those past recorded ground motions which were also recorded within the same vicinity like 100 km or slightly less or more right so you try to establish a selection criteria which is very closely matching with the seismicity of your site right so obviously in order to develop such a criteria that okay magnitude let's say 5 to 6 at a distance equal to 75 to 125 km recorded at site class d and for example some other parameters there are a lot of parameters which can be used to select or sort the ground motions from any ground motion database so uh, 
in order to establish that criteria uh, you must have an information about the seismicity level and seismicity characteristics seismotectonic environment of your study area even if you don't perform the site specific pssa you must first review few studies of the site specific pssas which are which may be available for your site right so those studies will give you an idea about what faults can contribute uh, to the hazard at your site or what are the properties of those faults how far they are located for example so in conventional design offices generally there is a team which is dedicated to this effort that team simply pass through all those steps of selecting and modifying ground motions and they just give it to the structural analysis team which simply use them import them in the analysis program and run the analysis but before that there is a whole procedure involved related to the selection modification of ground motions right so if for example you are located in a subduction environment close to a subduction zone then uh, you should only select those ground motions from anywhere in the world uh, which were produced by subduction zones if your hazard is controlled by shallow crustal earthquakes earthquakes which are produced by crustal faults and they are not very deep then you should focus only on the shallow crustal earthquakes which were recorded around the world so all the available ground motion databases they provide us a detailed form in which we can provide the criteria and from the from the hundreds and thousands of, of available ground motions that database can give us few ground motions which pass that criteria right and we can download their data time versus acceleration ground acceleration and then we can proceed to any further step of dynamic analysis so this is an important step because this belongs to the point in which we actually uh, focus on the nature of ground motions right so that we can select the most appropriate ground motions which um, which may occur or the type of those ground motions may occur at our site in future so if we make any mistake in this step all of our dynamic analysis everything will be wrong right if the hazard is mainly controlled by the short period kind of earthquakes high frequency earthquakes and we select low frequency earthquake here the dynamic response will be completely different right so different structures they are very sensitive sensitive to the type of ground motion which you use in the dynamic analysis frequency content of that ground motion right so we have seen in that ground motion parameters discussion that an earthquake two earthquakes having same pga may result in completely different response for the same uh, structure because their frequency content may be different right so frequency content is contributed by all of these factors how far is your site located what is the site class in between your site and your uh, seismic source for example and uh, most importantly the faulting mechanism what is the actual phenomena which produce that earthquake so let's say that you i just give you a quick overview that this these are the things which you should consider in this step 1 so if i have to select seven ground motions each having three components i will start with selecting like maybe 30 ground motions because i know that uh, if i select 30 uh, there may be some special ground motions in them some specific ones some may have some peculiar behavior i may have to drop them so i will start with around 30 if i have to select seven right from that database so there is a very uh, commonly used database called peer ground motion database pacific earthquake engineering research uh, you can find their link and uh, then make an account free of cost you can enter some selection criteria like magnitude range source to site distance range and site class other things 
and it will give you the ground motion histories in the text format which you can simply plot and modify further. One important uh, study which can help us in step 1 is called the deaggregation analysis. Seismic deaggregation analysis is uh, an analysis which we can perform after PSHA and this gives us uh, about the uh, con controlling hazard source information about that source that the hazard is contributed how much uh, by each source which is available or which is contributing to the to the hazard at your site. So, it will give us uh, a magnitude range and a source to site distance range which is participating the most in the hazard. We can directly use that range to select the ground motions for dynamic analysis right. So, this kind of an analysis, analysis will tell us that uh, what magnitude has the most contribution in the PGA number or SS number or S 1 number at our site or what source to site distance has the maximum contribution because PSHA it considers all sources, it considers all magnitudes and all source to site distances which have occurred in past as uh, given by the earthquake catalog right. So, from that it gives us those combinations which are contributing the most. So, if we have uh, the deaggregation study available for our site that is very important for this step 1 right. Then step 2 is that uh, you obviously apply that criteria to any ground motion database which have past ground motion records and they are increasing or multiplying uh, with every passing year. So, uh, you select those ground motions let us say I have to select 7. So, I may be starting with 25 30 and then I perform the basic signal processing of those ground motion acceleration histories to check the ground motion parameters PGA, peak ground acceleration, peak ground velocity, peak ground displacement. I will convert them from acceleration to velocity time history by integrating and then again integrating I can convert to displacement time history. So, I can see or visualize how the ground actually moved during that particular past ground motion. Then some frequency content related parameters predominant period right or Fourier spectrum or some other uh, ground motion parameters there is a detailed list which you can uh, you can calculate if the time history is available. So, any ground motion which have any you can say peculiar behavior or any abnormal behavior for example, which is not desired in the ground motion set which you want to use for your dynamic analysis you can drop at this stage right. For example, uh, you know that the seismic hazard is governed by the high frequency shallow crustal earthquake, short period earthquakes right. But if there is any ground motion which have a very low frequency content in that which will be directly visible from the Fourier spectrum or from the predominant number, then you can drop that ground motion and do not consider it further in the final set of 7 ground motions. Similarly, some other for example, uh, if the peak ground acceleration which is expected at your site is around 1 g and there is a ground motion which pass all that criteria still have a PGA which is like 0.01 g you can drop that one because it is too low. Uh, obviously, you will modify those ground motions to match the hazard level at your site later in step 3 or 4, but if it is as recorded PGA is very small then you may drop it initially right. So, you may select ground motions which already have a PGA between 0.5 g and 1.5 g right. So, you may drop very low amplitude ground motions or very high amplitude ground motions right from the start. So, these ground motion parameters give us an initial idea about the type of ground shaking, but the real idea will be visible 
or their characteristics will be visible when you plot their response spectrum acceleration response spectrum so the shape of acceleration response spectrum will give you a clear indication about what type of ground motion it is so that is the next step for the analysis of new buildings you construct the code based design response spectrum which defines the hazard level at your site and uh, obviously for that you will use the ss and s1 of your site or if you want to perform the site specific pssa that will also be uh, giving you a uniform hazard spectrum for your site so step 3 is the hazard level of your site right uh, 